and he's still in the business of doing miracles. He's still in the business of doing signs and wonders. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. He's never tired of hearing our prayers. When we are weak, he becomes stronger. And this morning, I want you to understand that he is going to do a miracle in your life in the name of Jesus. He's going to perform a turnaround in your life and your situation in the name of Jesus. God is at work in your life and in my life. It may not look like it today, but like my brother said to us yesterday or last week, and he said the scripture, your story is not ended yet. It is not over for you. God is at work. He's doing something. You might not see it now, but look at it through the eyes of the spirit because by the time the dust settles, you will still be standing. Nothing will frustrate your destiny. In the mighty name of Jesus, your story is an unfolding one. He's seeing you right now, not as you are, but as he made you from the very beginning. You are still the one who is going to finish that assignment. You are still the one who is going to finish your race strong. In the mighty name of Jesus. Yes, you might have made mistakes. You might have made poor choices. You might have fallen along the way. But I'm saying to you this morning, get up. Dust yourself off. The, dust, the, dust yourself off. And be, continue on this journey. You are going to reheat. You are going to finish strong in the mighty name of Jesus. Remember, it's not a hundred meter dash. It's a marathon. Stay the course. Make up your mind that you are not going to give up. You are going to finish strong in Jesus' mighty name. I want us to pray a prayer this morning from the book of Obadiah. Every son and daughter of God, you will possess your possession in this season in the mighty name of Jesus. I'm going to be reading Obadiah verse 15 to 18 in the message translation. God's judgment day is near for all godless nations. And I'm giving a parable this morning. May the Lord give us understanding in the name of Jesus. As you have done, it will be done to you. What you did will boomerang back and hit your own head. Just as you have parted on my holy mountain, all the godless nations will drink God's wrath. They will drink and drink and drink. They will drink themselves to death, but not so on Mount Zion. Why? Because on Mount Zion there shall be deliverers, but not so on Mount Zion. There is respite there, a safe and a holy place. The family of Jacob will take back their possessions from those who took them from them in the mighty name of Jesus. And this morning, will you take back your health? Will you take back your children? Will you take back your wife? Will you take back your properties? Will you take back everything that the enemy has taken away from you? Will you possess it back in the name of Jesus this morning? Possess your possession. It starts here first. Possess it in your mind. So that you can possess it on the ground. In Jesus' mighty name. That's when the family of Jacob will catch fire. And I say that each and every one of us is going to catch fire. In the mighty name of Jesus. The family of Joseph becomes fierce flame. In the name of Jesus while the family of Esau will be strong, Esau will go up in flames. Nothing left of Esau but a pile of ashes. Why? Because God said it and it is so. This morning, every walk of the flesh, everything that represents the walk of the flesh in your life and in my life will burn to ashes in the name of Jesus. There will be no trace of the works of the flesh in this ministry in the name of Jesus. Lord, upon this mountain today, we possess our possession. Every territory and ground you have allotted to us 
We lay claim and possess it today in the mighty name of Jesus. Today, Lord God, you will work a miracle in the lives of your people, both here on ground and online in the name of Jesus. We are pursuing and we are taking over and we are recovering all in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Blessed be your holy name. For in Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Can we have our seats? Can we have our seats? Praise the Lord. So this morning, the foundation of our teaching today, we are going to draw from some important truths shared in our last two Sergi Scripture teachings. Two Sundays ago, precisely on the 5th of November 2023, our supernatural SO, that, you know, I believe that since he has chosen to give my brother Stephen the title natural SO, it's only fitting that we give Papa the supernatural SO title. And so from today, that yeah, our supernatural SO. Praise the Lord. All right, so he delivered two powerful teachings during the search of scripture and, a, and also at the main service titled The Rachel and the Leah Church. And we drew lessons from the life of the patriarch, from the life and the family of the patriarch Jacob. He focused specifically on his two wives who were sisters and daughters of the same father and ended up highlighting 10 attributes each from the two to illustrate the two types of church that exist today. While I do not intend to go into all that he said in that message, for those of us who are not around, the message is already online. You can go to YouTube and listen to it. But there's a particular, I want to quote something that he said in that message. He said, it is amazing that Jesus paid a huge price for our salvation without asking us before going to the cross whether or not we would receive him as Lord and Savior. Can we remember that he said that? He says, nothing goes for nothing. We were bought with a huge price, the blood of Jesus Christ. It is for this reason that our body no longer belongs to us. We are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we must at all times glorify God in our body and in our spirit because they are no longer ours but God's. If we are ever going to be the bride of the coming king, you will need to forget your father's house, as Rachel did, so that the king will delight in you. I believe we all heard all that when he... Okay, praise God. He also mentioned reference to I, Rebecca, but he, he didn't go into details. But I'm going to put that here this morning. Because the same thing that happened to Rachel that, you know, she had to turn her back on her father's house to follow Jacob. It's the same way Rebecca, who became Isaac's wife, had to come to the same decision. Her parents asked her when Eliezer came to get her for Isaac. And the question that they asked her is, will you go with this man? And she responded, I will go. And we all know that Rebecca is a type of the bride of Christ, who the Holy Spirit typified by Eliezer in that scripture, the custodian of heaven's treasures, comes to get for the son Isaac. She went with Eliezer and ended up what? Forgetting her father's house. And just as she did, you and I one day made the decision to follow Jesus. Am I right? One day you made up that mind to go with Jesus. The question for the, on the, for, from this teaching this morning, or what this teaching seeks to ask each and every one of us is, how far are you and I willing to go on this journey with Jesus? So if you want to title this teaching this morning, it, we can give it the title, Going All the Way with God. In the same teaching, the, the serving overseer also put out a note of warning to the Rachel Church 
not to get to a place where she abuses the privilege or the privileges of the intimacy and affection shown to her by the king. I believe that this solemn warning should be given serious attention by the church today because as much as the king is delighted in Rachel and pours her affection on her, she still ended up having an inclination for the idols of her father's house. I hope you heard what I said. Yes, the Rachel church, she turned her back on her, fa on her father's house but she also took the idols from her father's house on that journey. When I read that story, I, I started asking several questions. If we go to Genesis chapter 31 this morning, can we quickly put that up? Genesis 31, I want to quickly read from verse 11 to 21. It's the story of when Jacob called his wives to him to inform them that it was time for them to leave, for him to start his own family and to go back to his father's, to his father's house. And in verse 11, he says, Then the angel, this is him speaking to his wives now, Then the angel of God spoke to me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, Here I am. And he said, Lift your eyes now and see all the rams which leap on the flocks are strict, speckled and grace-spotted, for I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land, and return to the land of your family. Then Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, Is there still any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? Are we not considered strangers by him? For he has sold us and also completely consumed our money. <laughs> that their father is a very sharp man. For all these riches which God has taken from our father are really ours and our children's. Now then, whatever God has said to you, do it. Then Jacob rose and set his sons and his wives on camels, and he carried away all his livestock and all his possessions which he had gained, his acquired livestock which he had gained in Padanaram, to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. Now Laban had gone to share his sheep, and Rachel did what? Had stolen the household idols that were her father's. And Jacob stole away, unknown to Laban the Syrian, in that he did not tell him that he intended to flee. So he fled with all that he had. He arose and crossed the river and headed towards the mountain of Gilead. Question. Even after both her and her sister Leah had attested to the fact that God was the source behind the transfer of all the wealth of Laban, their father, to their house husband, Jacob, and that they had no portion any longer in their father's house, what was the attraction? Or why did Rachel still go ahead to steal her father's household idols? She, they, both, they both testified that it was God who did the transfer of that will. So there must have been some element of, you know, God's knowledge that Jacob may, might have transferred to, that, to his family. Am I correct? So the question is, what exactly is it that attracted Rachel into taking her father's idols? First question. Second one, was it to ridicule her father? Because he has taken everything already. Okay, so let, let's even take this one that, <laughs> that might be so important to you because in those days, when you are given inheritance, you also pass you the idols, the gods of your fathers. You hand them over to your children as an inheritance. Secondly, was it for her to lay claim to the fact that she at least inherited something from her father since they had both claimed that their father had sold them and also completely consumed their money? Third question, or was she just simply too attached to her native religion? Those were the questions that, you know, came up to me while I was going through that scripture. And I want each and every one of us to also give it some thought because it's important. Whatever reason she might have had to do such a thing, it was a dangerous thing for her to have done. 
because she eventually died on the way. She did not finish well. God detests idolatry and mixture. We cannot claim to be serving the one and only true God and still have other idols we are bowing to and serving. If there are idolatrous practices from your past, idolatrous festivities that you still partake in, you know some of us, we have this way of saying that we are going back to the village. There is something we are going to do in the village. And those festivities and those and those practices, we don't know how dangerous they are. And that you still partake in ancient family covenants you were initiated to, whether consciously or unconsciously, that is still operating in your life today. I beseech you by the mercies of God that you must make up your mind to cut off from them all by every means in the mighty name of Jesus. You cannot follow God and carry idols along with you, you will self-destruct. Second Corinthians, we can go to Second Corinthians, I'm not going to touch that. Second Corinthians 6, 14 to 18. One important thing we all must understand is God is a jealous God. In fact, one of his names is jealous. I don't know if you know. Yes. He is not interested in sharing us with anyone. Or any entity. He wants to possess all of us. Both within, around, everywhere. He wants to possess us completely. So there is no ground for any other thing outside of his presence. Outside of his being that should be in our lives. If you go to Exodus chapter 34, verse 12 to 14. Maybe I should quickly read that. To lay this Emphasis, Exodus chapter 34. I want to read the New Living Translation, please. It says, be very careful never to make a treaty with the people who live in the land where you are going. If you do, you will follow their evil ways and be trapped. Instead, you must break down their pagan altars, smash their sacred pillars, and cut down their Asherah poles. You must worship no other gods for the Lord, whose name is what? Is jealous. Is a God who is jealous about his what? His relationship with you. So he's a jealous God. And spirits are mostly that way. Even spirits that possess people. If you have been offered to an idol or a, what do you call it now? Or, or, or a, a, a shrine. You know that there are those things whether we like it or not, they are potent. You will find situations where people have what they call husband, wife, husband, whatever, and all of those things. But the reality we must understand is that those things we need to consciously ensure we cut ourselves from those things by God's grace and God's power in the mighty name of Jesus. We must make up our minds. It's a serious matter for the church of God today, we must separate ourselves from everything or anything that reduces or, 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 or negates God's presence and God's power in our lives. Praise God. Indulging in idolatrous practices not only weakens you as an individual, as a believer, it also weakens the church corporately. What you are doing, you are not doing, you, don't, you think it's is, is not about you. The way God has, has, is building his church is such that every part is supposed to contribute its own part. Every part is supposed to contribute its own quota to the building of that body. So whatever it is that you and I are doing, you must understand that it will affect my brother, it will affect my sister. I'm not, I'm not on an island by myself. And God has chosen to build his church that way. So it's either you are willing to stay on the side of God or you can just decide that you want to go back fully into those, into those things. But as long as you want to be a part of the body of Christ, as long as you want to remain 
relevant in the things that pertain to God's work on the face of the earth, you cannot afford to carry such things with you. Praise the Lord. If we must remain the delight of the king and retain our passion for him, then we must ensure that we consecrate ourselves wholly to him and we must express it with the utmost fidelity to him in the mighty name of Jesus. The second important truth I want to draw from as foundation today's teach, for today's teaching is from the powerful revelatory truth that my brother shared with us last Sunday. In his teaching titled The Sign of Hosea, he used the ministry of Prophet Hosea to illustrate God's redemptive act towards Israel and especially highlighted the price that Christ paid for our redemption. He paid it all out in full, over and above, to ensure that he secured what? Both our spirit, our soul, and our body. And he not only did that, he did it into the past, he did it for the present, and also into the future. Can we shout hallelujah? Hallelujah. So you are covered in every way. And I also am covered in every way, which is part of the reason why we must be careful and we must give everything that we have to him. One particular emphasis he also made was regarding how God uses prophets as a sign to a generation, or late, probably later on, to generations that are yet to come. And we also read Isaiah 8:18. Last week, where he says, here I am and the children whom the Lord has given me. We are for what? We are for signs and wonders in Israel from the, lost of, from the Lord of hosts who dwells in Zion. And we also know that this same scripture was used for Christ in the New Testament. In the book of Hebrews chapter 2 verse 13, he says, and again, I will put my trust in him and again, Here am I and the children whom God has given me. I'm trying to substantiate the truth that we all as believers are also signs and wonders. Whether you hold the office of a prophet or not, as long as you have been redeemed in Christ Jesus, you and I have become signs and wonders to our generation. And so in Mark chapter 16, verse 15 to 18, he says that, and Jesus said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be what? Will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. And those signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will do what? They will cast out demons. So what are the signs for each and every believer? Our ability to cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. That is our portion That is what God has made each and every one of us. If only we believe him that these things are the signs that every one of us or needs to be seen around every one of us. It is a pointer that there is a greater power that is at work. And eventually it is to bring glory to the one and only true king and the God of all flesh. As believers, we must understand that our conduct, our unity as one, our uncompromising and unrelenting commitment to the cause and furtherance of the gospel of Christ is ultimately a sign to our adversaries of a certain destruction that awaits them except they repent. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27 to 30. Quickly, please, from the Passion Translation. Whatever happens, do what? Keep living your lives based on the reality of the gospel of Christ, which reveals him to others. So the way we live our lives reveals to others who we are, what we are serving, who we are serving, of whom we belong to. And then when I come to see you or hear good reports of you, 
please go on. I'll know that you stand united in one spirit and one passion, celebrating together as conquerors in the faith of the gospel. And then you will never be shaken or intimidated by the opposition that rises up against us. For your courage will only prove as a sure sign from God of their coming destruction and that you have found what? A new life. For God has graciously given you the privilege not only to believe in Christ, but also to suffer for him. For you have been called by him to endure the conflict in the same way I have endured it. For you knowing, for, for you knowing I'm not giving up. Praise the Lord. Going by all these aforementioned scriptures, I reckon we, we, have, we can come to an agreement that both the church corporate and individuals as believers will be raised to become signs and wonders to our generation. If we, have, if we agree so far with all that has been said, then we must get to the fact that the bride of Christ is expected to maintain her purity. That there's no, there's no way we can allow mixture in our midst. And the fact that she is a sign to the world. We'll proceed now to look deeper into further lessons that we can draw from the life of Rachel, the Rachel Church, and from the life and ministry of Professor Sia. That will probably just help us proceed on this journey to, for us to remain a delight to our king and a vessel through which God sends a message to our generation. So what are the further lessons that we can take from it? Uh, well, for the purpose of this tree, I'm going to look at two critical, very important things or virtues that I believe that should every believer and every one of us needs to consciously practice on a daily basis. If we are going to ever carry the power if we are going to ever make the kind of effect that God wants to have walk through us in impacting the world. And these two virtues that I, we are going to be looking into this morning is obedience and our consecration. They are very powerful virtues that every one of us must consciously, it's a conscious thing that we must every day practice. Practice obeying the voice of God. Practice obeying the word of God. Because it also has repercussions when we do not do that. And like the serving overseer said last Sunday, what's the point of coming to church every single time? You don't miss any program. You are praying, 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 praying. You are doing all everything religious. You are found there. But when it comes to a life of transformation... There's nothing to show for it. So we cannot continue to play church because the very, the very foundations and the basic things that we need as believers, we are consciously not, we are, those things are consciously eroding from our midst as a church. This issue of obedience is very, very important to God and it should be important to us also. And our consecration also ought to be important to you and I. Praise the Lord. We'll be looking at the obedience. And please, you might be thinking that, oh, this teaching is, might probably be too basic. Yes, I think it's high time that we go back to the basics. We seek too much revelatory truths. And we forget the very things that are the foundation of our, of, of our Christian of our Christian, you know, life and ministry. And those are the things that really matter. So we are looking at the issue of obedience. And we are going to be profiling the life of Prophet Hosea, Hosea to see what it means to obey God. And I think the very first place we need to start in this is to ask ourselves, how well are you and I doing regarding obeying God's voice and obeying his word. Because as long as we are children of God, as long as we are com connected to him, as long as we have the Holy Spirit in us, God is always bound to give us instructions. 
And one thing I need us to take away from this lesson this morning is to have a different perception of God if we don't have that perception already. That yes, God is our Father, He's our Savior, He's our Redeemer, He's all of those good things, but we often forget that He's also a King. And kings, what do they do? They give instructions. They, they give commands. They don't give suggestions. So whenever God is speaking to you and I, he's not suggesting to us. He is telling you, do this. Go this way. He's not suggesting. He's a king. Even our earthly kings that we have here, how do we obey them? How do you lay prostrate before a king when you see him, when he comes and he sits down? How do we lay prostrate before them? How much more the king of heaven and earth and the one who holds your breath in his hands? And so we cannot afford to joke with the issue of obedience and let us have that perception of him that he is a God, that he is a king. And except we just want to deceive ourselves we can't be of any use to him if we are, we are lacking in the area of obedience. In fact, the name of Jesus will be weak on your tongue, on your lips. His, he, his name will not carry power. His name will not be able to do anything because in the area of obeying him, and if we understand the way these things work in the spirit realm, it's not like here that when we are giving instructions, you can decide whether or not to do it. It's not like that there. There is order. There is order in that realm. And because we are also spirit beings, God also understands, and both the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light understands these things more than we do. And we cannot afford to remain ignorant as believers, thinking that the more we ignore God and we disobey him, we are going to go any distance with him. We cannot go. It is not possible. We need to make up our minds whether we want to go the old hog with him or whether we just want to remain in the same position and in the same spot that we found ourselves. Praise the Lord. Let's quickly look. How did the word of God come to prophet Hosea? Let's even check and see whether when God spoke to Hosea, whether he was suggesting it to him. Ah, Hosea, seems like I want to do something in Israel, but... You don't mind, make I use you as him. No. It says, the word of the Lord, Hosea chapter 1, verse 1 to 2. It says, the word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Beri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. Let's look at it. When the Lord began to speak by Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, what? Go. Does that sound like a suggestion? Go take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. It's not a suggestion. Let's, other, let's look at other examples in the scripture. Um, let's look at prophet Jeremiah also. When God was going to ordain him into the ministry of a prophet, into the office of a prophet, what did the Lord say? He says, I'm reading from verse 4. He says, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. <laughs> then said I, ah, Lord, behold, I cannot speak for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, what? Do not say I am a youth for you shall, you shall do what? You shall do what? Is that a suggestion? Whether he liked it or not, it was a command. For you shall go to all whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. It's not a suggestion. It says, do not be afraid of your faces, for I am with you to deliver you. And that's the good part with God. If God sends you on a message, he's going to back you. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Please go to verse 17. Verse 17 says, Therefore, prepare yourself and do what? And arise and speak to them all that I command you. 
Do not be dismayed before their faces, lest I do what? Lest I dismay you before them. So God is not in the business of uh, let's, no. He's a loving God. He's a loving Father. He loves us, yes. But he also expects obedience from us. We all are parents also. How do you feel when you give your son, your daughter, your children a, an instruction to carry out and they don't do it? What happens? Oh, do we just say, you say, I, I, I told you to do this thing and you, go and sit down your, uh, very soon. That child will run over you. And God forbid. Let's also look at another example. Let's look at the example of Abraham, the father of faith. At least, let's trace our, our history to where it began. And what, how did God inst- what did God say to Abraham when he came to him in Mesopotamia and said to him, he said what? Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. He says, now the Lord had said to Abraham, do what? Get out of your country from your family and from your father. Is that the way to tell somebody? <laughs> it is well. So what am I trying to drive at here? Is for us to understand that God gives instructions and he expects those instructions to, to be obeyed. For our own reading, I took only also one example from the New Testament out of various examples the, the, the instruction he gave Ananias when after the conversion of Paul, he said to Ananias, he appeared to Ananias and said to him, he called him, he says, here I am, Lord. Go ahead, please. So the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Street. So, Asheni, arise and go. There's no, dis- even when he was trying to you know, give excuses for not going. The Lord, he was emphatic on it. And he was not going to change. So we must understand that God operates from a command center. We are all soldiers of the Lord, are we not? Uh-huh. So soldiers receive instruction and they obey the last word, the last, the last command. The day we stop taking commands from him is the last time we hear from him until we return to him in obedience. You can be doing something that looks like church. But if you are not in obedience with him, you will find out that. And you see, the very things that we make the mistake of using as parameters for our progress are not the things that God uses. He does not see the way we see. He does not measure the way we measure. So you can be, you can, you can be prospering. You can be succeeding in what you are doing. But God forbid that at the end of the day, we come to a place where we find that we, the, our ladder was leaning on the wrong wall. And you know the thing about it is that if you say you are going on a straight line right now, God has given you the instruction to walk this straight line to get to where the um, audio loft is there. You will know that the moment you decide to take a 10 degree for those who, I am not too good in geometry and all of those things. But the moment you choose to take a 10 degree shift, where will you end up? Will you end up in that same spot? You can never end up there. The moment you take that, and you, and you know, sometimes, like Pastor will say to us, the road, the road to hell is full of good intentions. It's paved with good intentions. So if we feel that, okay, what God has given me as an instruction is not as important as the things that I want to carry out myself, it's a question of time. We'll find out whether or not God is the one who is true or we ourselves. Praise the Lord. If God is not speaking and we're not getting direction or guidance from him, how then can one make any meaningful progress in life? Obedience to God is contingent on our love for him He wants our obedience to arise from a loving relationship with him. And that is why I said he is a loving God. He has expressed love to us. He expects that love to be expressed back to him. And so in obeying him, we are only expressing it back to him that we love you. And that is why I'm, you know, I find it, it's a pleasure to obey you. But whether or not every instruction he gives us is easy, we will find out in the course of this message. 
He wants our obedience to a true test of our love for God is in our obedience to his word. And in turn, he also promises to make himself what's known to us. In John chapter 14, if we quickly go to John chapter 14, just to, for us to lay that emphasis that God, he says a little while longer and the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live. You will live also. At that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you what in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. So we can run, we can keep saying we love God, we love God. The only way God knows we love him is when we obey him. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and do what? I will manifest myself to him. Let's jump to 23. It says, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my father will love him, and we will do what? And we will come to him and make what? Our abode with him. We will dwell with such a person. I will find that person a dwelling place. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine but the fathers who sent me. Praise the Lord. I want to quickly go to the next thing I want to say this morning. Obeying God may not be easy, but it always pays in the long run. What did I say? Obeying God is not always easy. All God's instruction to you has been easy. Even these men that we are looking and profiling, these men of God in the scriptures, when God came to prophet to say and said to him, somebody that must have been keeping himself, right? And God now says, no, prostitute is a harlot that you, you are going to marry. How many of us, let's picture ourselves. Brother Mike, no, I'm talking about Brian Cardio, not my pastor. Eh? If God comes to you and says to you, Mike, and he says, your wife is in Ayilara Street. You will locate her Abi, in Suruleri. That's the, that is where you are going to go and get the wife that I'm giving to you. What will you say? You will bind that voice. That, that's the voice of the... So please, let's understand that it's not always every instruction that is given to us that is easy. And we all have an example in the house. Pastor has shared so many of his stories with us on certain instructions that God had given to him. Those instructions, humanly speaking, are not instructions that you just get up and you say, hey, I will. but because he has given himself to obeying him. And it's because of that obedience that you and I are sitting here today. Imagine he was prospering in what he was doing before. Until God said him, shut down everything and go into this work of ministry. Now imagine that he did not obey the voice of the Lord God. You and I will not be here. I'm not sure you understand what I'm saying. Because whether we like it or not, in the fulfillment of his destiny, some of us, that is where our own destinies will be fulfilled. So if he did not obey God, you and I would not be here. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. That revelation came personally to me many years ago. I just woke up from the bed to sit and to start praying. And the Lord just said to me, myself, keep lifting his hands in prayers. For in the fulfillment of his destiny, you will find your own fulfillment. So it's a revelation. It's not... I'm speaking from the point of revelation. And I'm saying to every one of us this morning that every one of us, because whatever God wants to do, he will do, put everything in one man for you and for me. And it is now left for us. We either say we are aligning with what God has planned for you and I, or we choose to do it our own way. But we will not get the same results. Praise the Lord. So do you think, so let's go on. And why do I say it's not always easy to obey? See, 
if there's any area in my life where I know that God has really helped me, that God showed up and showed me mercy, is in the area of my marriage. I've shared this testimony a couple of times, but you see, when I was going to, when I went, when I went for, for service, as we got to the orientation camp, and we were doing all that we were doing, my eye just spotted a damsel. Ah, I said, a lady. By the time I'm done in this place, I will have something to show for my labors in the, in the, in the state of Enugu. And I saw that damsel, and I, ah, I said, this one, she cannot escape. And so I went, and by the time they were going to give us, send us to our various posts, she was posted in, 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 um, in Enugu city, I, like God, God, God knew that this boy, if I allow them to leave you in the city, you will cause trouble. He sent me to the last, to the, to the last local government, the border of Benue State, that borders Enuguam. That was where I went to serve. But you see, every opportunity I had to come back to the city, because I was also made the coordinator of the NCCF for that local government. And so every time when we needed to go back to Enugu for, um, what do we call these meetings that we have? Where's Brother John? He will know because he was a state ex school. And so I will look for every opportunity to go and see, to just to be able to see her because I know she will be there. And so what happened when this thing started, I just, I now started having dreams. I now started having dreams. And those dreams initially, they looked to be good. But as God kept on going, those things now started showing me. And you know, I quickly, I quickly told my brother, Brother John Adetola, we served together in Enugu. I said to him that, look, I am interested in this lady. And he said to me, just hold your peace. We'll keep praying. <laughs> that prayer. And I knew for the very first time, I don't know for whatever reason, I called my mom to share it with her. She's a believer. So it was easy for me to share it with her that, look, I have seen so, so, so person. I, I think this is the woman. My mom, after a few days, came back and told me, I said to her, mom, no, I didn't say to her, in my mind, that my mom is still tribalistic because the lady is from Cross River. So I felt that, okay, maybe because of that tribal, this thing is why my mom came back to say that to me. But you see, not to cut the long story short, several, several instructions came. There was a particular day I was in my room alone and I was reading a book by Watchman Nee, Love Not the World. There was a scripture in that book, just that scripture. And you know, God is so, God is so wonderful. He, that scripture came, he came alive to me like, and I knew God was talking about that matter. I started crying, I cried like a baby that day. You will not understand. I cried because I knew God was telling me there is no way there. I'm sharing this story with our youths today. And by the time I was going to, I still went on. I, I made up my mind. I said there is nothing that prayer cannot do. As if it is not, yes, that there is nothing prayer cannot do. And is this same God that is telling me not to go there that I want to pray to? By the time we were going to round off, by the time we were going to round off that um, session, the, a few days to the end, I told my brother that I was going to propose to her, I cannot let this girl escape, because once we leave here, the opportunity, she will be staying in Calabar, I will be in Lagos. The night, the night before I went to, to propose, the dream was so, it was so, as in, if anything that God showed me before then was maybe, uh, I, I'm not sure. This one, it was so vivid that was, there is no way in this place that you are going. I woke up in the morning. I didn't tell my brother. I knew that once I told him, he would tell me not to go. I had made up my mind. I'm telling you, sometimes we can be strong-headed. It is only God's mercy that delivers us from destruction. I went ahead and I proposed to her. I'm telling you, she went, she eventually, she gave me a yes. 
But you see, from that day, she gave me that yes. How many of us have we read? Please give me quickly. Quickly. Psalm 32, Psalm 32, Psalm 32. It's not in my notes. See, you know, there are some scriptures in the Bible that will just, you, it, it becomes flesh. Psalm 32, ah, you are not there. He said, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Go on. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept what? Kept silent, my bones grew what? Old. Through my groaning all the day long. Continue. For the day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Selah. This, this thing that, I'm, that we are reading now happened literally to me. I will, woke up, I will wake up every morning. My heart will be big, 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 big. I'm telling you, I, I was having palpitations. I could not rest. I could not, even with all of that, we will still do MTN Midnight Cool. cool. I mean, what do you call those? I still, I was still at that man. He got to a time, Moni Moma Kuo. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not doing it again. I quickly ran to my brother and told him, I have, a, I have a confession to make. You see that thing that God is not there. Ah! He said, and this is a precious daughter. Of, there was nothing wrong with that lady. But you see, there was something I remembered in the course of all that process was what pastor says to us that about destiny clash. Ah! So I, if my destiny and this lady's destiny is not, is not compatible, if I truly say I love her, I should be willing to let her go. So that was the decision. And we prayed together, and she came to Lagos one time, and I just had to break it off. What am I saying to us this morning? That was God's mercy to me. Not everybody might enjoy that same mercy. Some, God gave them those kind of Warnings, warnings, they refused and they went into those marriages and today some of them are no more. Because they entered into abusive marriages, they entered into, you, you know, all, all manner of issues that will arise in their, in, their, in, their mar, in their marital lives and something just snuffs their lives away. Was it that God did not speak to them? No. Praise the Lord. By the time God was going to give me my wife, <laughs> I told him, no, there's no way there. When he said to me, Bumi is your wife, I said, oh, no, son of me. I know grief. I, I'm telling you, because, you know, there are certain features that we all are looking for in a woman. Hey! See, I'm just, I'm just saying it as it is. But you see, what I'm, where am I going? If there's anything that God has done for me that I will forever be grateful to him for is the wife he has given to me. So to me, she did not fit the picture, but God knew that this one is the one that will fulfill destiny with you. Praise the Lord. So darling, We cannot finish this thing this morning. We will come back to it. Um, let me just make one or two other points. Our knowledge is, in, is, fin, is finite. And so in dealing with a God who possesses infinite knowledge and who knows the end from the beginning and everything else in between, we need to trust him enough that he's got our back and has our interest at heart. Even if things do not turn out the way we expect, it's either because he's got something better in store for us. But then again, as difficult as it may seem, we often have to come to terms that there are just certain things that happen while we're on this side of eternity that we'll never understand until we see him in glory. Though it may be a hard pill to swallow, it is also important to remember that it's not so much about you and I. But in the end, but it's ultimately about his glory. 
It's ultimately about his glory. It's not about you and I. He said to Peter, he said, when you were young, you could go wherever you wanted to go, but a time will come that one will take you by the hand and lead you to where you do not want to go. And the scripture says that he was trying, he was trying to give him a glimpse of the kind of death he was going to die. Praise the Lord. And so it may not always, those instructions may not always seem, you know, so easy for us, but it is, there is a, there, as long as you follow that path, you will keep seeing light and you will end up in God. Can we rise up this morning? If God gives us the opportunity, we might continue with this next Sunday. Because we are still going to touch on the issue of consecration. We have not finished this, but we will still do that and we will do the issue of consecration. Can we lift up our hands to him this morning? Father, I, I want, can you ask him for grace? Grace to yield, grace to obey, grace to, to be able, that, you know, it is grace, it is grace. It is not that we have it in ourselves to be able to do these things. He's the one that gives us the grace. He furnishes grace to every one of us. Can you ask him for that grace this morning? The grace to obey your every word, your voice when it comes to me, Lord, help me to obey you in every way, Lord, in the name of Jesus. That every one of us, oh God, will come to a place where we understand that when you speak to us, it's because there is a destiny in view, because there is a plan that you already have that you are unfolding. Help us, oh Lord, to partner with you. Help us, oh Lord, Father, at every single point in time to yield to your instructions, Father. Thank you, Father, this morning. Blessed be your holy name. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone.